Is there a moment when the Messenger of Allah was almost killed? Did the Prophet ever make jokes or was he always a very serious person? How did the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him die and what was his last words? The Prophet was taking punches, was getting spit at, was being hit with shoes. There is no Khadija عنها, to receive the Prophet after that trip. There is no Abu Talib to say, I'll protect you from the people of Mecca. It's enough. You've been hurt by these people so long, all of the rejection. Mecca is done. Ta'if is done. What good is left in these people? And the Prophet said that maybe from their children, there will be those who say, La ilaha illallah. Every stone that hit him in Ta'if hit him for me. If the Prophet still had faith in, in, in humanity and his ummah to, to grow out of that, then it becomes very, very, very different. So, Jazakallahu khaira, Ya Rasulullah. Jazakallahu khaira. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh Omar Suleiman. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As to our journey, we thank you so much for hosting us at Yakin Campus in Dallas. Jazakallah khair. Welcome so, to my side. Jazakallah Welcome to Texas. Alhamdulillah. We have some questions about our Prophet, our beloved Prophet والسلام, today. And uh, I want to start by the first one. I once heard a saying that the Prophets are the ones who suffer the most in this world. We hear that the Prophet والسلام, also suffered great calamities. Which period do you think was the heaviest one for him? SubhanAllah, when it comes to the Prophet وسلم, indeed he suffered in every way and he had a share of every Prophet's suffering before him. And so that's why the stories of the Prophets before him affected him so deeply. Like if you think about Sayyidina Yusuf السلام, the Prophet وسلم, was the most beloved son of Mecca and then he was thrown away by his brothers and then he was taken by another land after estrangement as a leader and then he came back and he forgave his brothers. When Maryam السلام, was slandered, the Prophet وسلم, was slandered despite his purity and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala absolved him from that slander. Musa السلام, or Isa السلام, La adho Musa. Don't be like those who hurt Musa السلام. So the Prophet وسلم, had a share of every Prophet's trials before him. But as Ibn Mas'ud عنه, was touching his body with the fever and he said it's so hot SubhanAllah, like how can any human being bear the, the heat of the fever? The Prophet said, That is because I have ajran, two rewards. So double the reward, double the test. His most difficult trial though, is not the one that was physical. So Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet وسلم, if Uhud was the worst day of his life. Why? Because his teeth were knocked out, the blood was all over his face, he lost his companions in, in, in martyrdom and shahada in the battlefield. It was a very difficult day and he said, no, it was Ta'if, Ham al-Huzn, the year of grief. When the Prophet ﷺ was alone and he is walking away from a people and they're not even acknowledging him. Before they stoned him, before they spit at him, before they punched him, alayhi salatu wasalam, he had a lot of hopes in them. He thought that this was going to be the answer to his dream. And you know, when you have high hopes and expectations, the hurt and the pain of disappointment is more. They wouldn't even talk to him. They were, they were talking about him as if he's not in the room. And that's the most hurtful thing for you when people talk about you as if you're not even in the room. Say, who is this man? And I'm not gonna talk to him. They mocked him and then they lined up the two rows of the people, the hoodlums and the children of Ta'if to stone him, to spit at him, to beat him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For a span of over 20 kilometers, the Prophet Sallallahu was taking punches, was getting spit at, was being hit with shoes. And you can imagine that he remembers alayhi salatu wasalam, the things that were said to him that never got recorded in the books of Sirah because only he heard those insults alayhi salatu wasalam. And then he said, I found myself completely alone, you know, in this in this strange garden in Qarnat Ta'alib and that's where the Prophet وسلم, makes his famous du'as. But you know what's amazing, subhanAllah, two things. Number one, there is no Khadija radiallahu anha to receive the Prophet وسلم, Zamiruni after that trip. There was no Abu Talib to say, I'll protect you from the people of Mecca now. And that's why Sa'am al Huzn, he lost Khadija radiallahu anha. And that was compounded by the pain of humiliation, of oppression from the people of Ta'if. And with that, subhanAllah, with that, the Prophet وسلم, made dua the entire night at Ta'if. And we don't have access to those duas because no one was with him وسلم, except Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu was around. But we don't know how beautiful, how painful, how powerful those duas were. And he told Aisha radiallahu anha that was the worst day of his life Everything that he experienced, that was the worst day. Some of the scholars say it combined the pain of rejection at Safa with his initial call with the pain of the hits at Uhud in one place in Ta'af. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. SubhanAllah. Jibreel comes to the Prophet and the blood is still fresh on his body. 
the insults are still fresh and Jibreel introduces the angel who moves the mountains to the Prophet and says, I can crush all of these people between an akhshabain. That's not just the people of Ta'if, by the way, it's also the people of Mecca. So everyone between those two mountains, meaning it's enough. You've been hurt by these people so long, all of the rejection. Mecca is done, Ta'if is done. What good is left in these people? And the Prophet said that maybe from their children, there will be those who say, La ilaha illallah. Allah took the Prophet on the night journey of Al Isra' al Mi'raj after that difficult journey. So, subhanAllah, after being rejected by the people and stoned by the people, he's welcomed in the heavens and all of the prophets are talking to him and the angels are talking to him. And there's a moment on that night that always gives me shivers. The Prophet saw us, he saw his Ummah. So imagine he looked out and he saw one Ummah and he said, Is this my Ummah? And Jibreel said, No. He turns him and he shows him an Ummah that was twice as big, that was much bigger than the Ummah of Bani Israel. He says, This is your Ummah, Ya Muhammad. So Rasulullah looked out at that Ummah. In that Ummah, there are descendants from Ta'if, descendants from Mecca, and then people from all over the world, all generations that speak different languages and look different, but they're all united by La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And he was looking at us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you wonder, you know, at times, did the Prophet see me? Did the Prophet recognize me? Did I stand out to the Prophet And may Allah make it as such that if we didn't, if we'll never know here, but we will know. We ask Allah that when we meet him at the Kothar, at his held at the Kothar, inshallah, that the Prophet be excited to see us as we're excited to see him When he brought Islam, almost all of his tribe rejected him. Didn't they try to assassinate him? Is there a moment when the Messenger of Allah was almost killed? So the Prophet was almost killed multiple times. Um, you know, when you have a beast like Abu Jahl, he's the Fir'aun of this Ummah. Abu Jahl was the first one to normalize the shedding of the Muslim blood in the Haram and outside the Haram, shedding the blood of the Muslims. And he wanted the Prophet ﷺ dead. And there were times that he contemplated it and he even thought about crushing the Prophet ﷺ in his sujood. And Abu Jahl was a huge man, the size of Umar al-Khattab His body was huge, physically a large man. And the Prophet ﷺ said if he does it, then Jabir Islam would have killed him. If he would have tried to do what he said he was going to do that day, Jibreel would have taken him at that moment. But there's the attempt on the Prophet ﷺ that obviously takes place during the Hijrah. And a Fir'aun is not someone who's just physically oppressive. He's also someone who's psychologically oppressive. You look today at the Fir'aun of the world in, in Israel and what they are doing. Netanyahu is a Pharaoh. He's not just playing physical games, but also the psychological games and tactics, right? And so. Abu Jahl came up with this idea of having multiple tribes, right? And, and the elders of Quraysh had this idea of having multiple tribes to kill the Prophet ﷺ so that they could spread the blame amongst them so that no one group could be blamed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the Prophet ﷺ on that day. They intended to kill the Prophet ﷺ on Badr. They intended to kill the Prophet ﷺ on Uhud. The one man who was killed by the hand of the Prophet ﷺ, Ubay ibn Khalaf. There's only one human being the Prophet ﷺ ever killed with his hand. And the Prophet ﷺ said the worst person is someone قَتَلَ نَبِيَهُ who kills his Prophet أو قَتَلَهُ نَبِيهُ or his Prophet kills him. And in his Ummah, there's only one person he ever killed. And it was Ubay ibn Khalaf who swore that on that day of Uhud, I would not survive if he survives, meaning one of us is going to die. And the Prophet ﷺ threw a spear at him as he was charging that just nicked him at the side of the neck. And it wasn't even a severe wound. And he started to say, قَتَلَنِي مُحَمَّدْ قَتَلَنِي مُحَمَّدْ Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Prophet ﷺ killed me, the Prophet ﷺ killed me. And they said, no, it's just a light wound. And subhanAllah, the wound was infected and he died from it. The one man, the Prophet ﷺ, rahmatan lil alameen, a mercy to the world, ever killed with his hand Sallallahu But they tried to kill him in Uhud. They wanted to kill him in Khandaq. It was a genocide attempt in Khandaq, right? To circulate Medina from all directions and to to force them into a tight spot and then to sac sacrifice them all to their idols. They wanted so many times. Even at Fatih Mecca, some of them were still plotting to kill the Prophet So multiple assassination attempts. But with that, look at the tawakkul of the Prophet Look at his trust. When there was a noise that would be heard outside of Medina, if you ran to the outskirts of Medina before anyone else got there, the bravest people of this ummah, they would see Rasulullah on his horse with his sword unsheathed protecting the people of Medina. So the Prophet was not afraid because he had trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knew that his life and his death were all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's not worried about that. Ali radiallahu anhu says, when the battle used to become tough, we used to get behind the Prophet in the battle. But the Prophet would not kill. He would disarm and he would fight forward, but he wouldn't kill Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, except for Ubay ibn Khalaf 
for the, the oath that he took to kill the Prophet Did the Prophet ever make jokes or was he always a very serious person? This is one of the most amazing things about the character of the Prophet If someone buries six of his seven children, two of his wives, Khadija radiallahu anha then Zainab bint Khuzayma, has lost his father before he was born, then his mother, then his grandfather, then his uncle, has lost Hamza radiallahu anhu and seen him shredded to pieces, has lost all these people around him, has been oppressed this way. You would think this person would be a jaded person. But the Prophet was basaman lahakan. He would always smile and make other people smile and he would always laugh and make other people laugh. But the Prophet had a dignified laughter. When he would laugh وسلم, it was a wider smile so you could see the back of his teeth. So it wasn't like an audible obnoxious laugh. It was a, a dignified laugh. And the believer's laugh as Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah says is a dignified laugh. It's not a laugh of ghafla, of heedlessness. Because the Prophet heart was always attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the laugh after is also prophetic. But he was always smiling وسلم, and he was always laughing alayhi salatu wasalam. But his laughter was dignified and his jokes were pure sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And there's something deeply profound about that, that the Prophet وسلم, would not lie, he would not um, taunt, he would not mock. Usually our jokes come at the expense of the other person. When the Prophet وسلم, joked with you, he made you feel better about yourself. You know, when we joke, we put each other down. The Prophet ﷺ would make a joke that would make you feel great about yourself. So he, he wouldn't give you a bad nickname, he'd give you a good nickname. He wouldn't mock your appearance, he would make you feel good about your appearance. He wouldn't say something bad about your tribe, he'd say something good about your tribe. The Prophet ﷺ made jokes that made people feel more honored, which is very rare. And he didn't debase himself by lying, because lying debases yourself. So he didn't do that Wasallam. But the thing that amazes me, especially right now with everything happening in Gaza, you know, someone say, how can you smile? How can you smile when everything ha is happening in Gaza right now? And the reality, and around the world, the reality is that the Prophet Sallallahu smiled during the worst of times, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because the Prophet Sallallahu always had perspective. All of those people that have been killed in Gaza are shuhada, are martyrs bi ta'ala. They're enjoying a transcendent life that is far greater than this life. And those that are left behind, we trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. We trust Allah with them as we trust Allah with us. So do we cry? We cry. The Prophet ﷺ used to cry for his ummah, but he'd also smile at his ummah. That's the beautiful mix here. He smiled at you and then he cried for you. When he did da'wah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he even smiled at those people in Mecca to hopefully bring them to Islam, to soften their hearts. And then he cried, making dua for them to be guided. So the Prophet ﷺ had an intention, a niyyah. You know, we always talk about intention. He had a niyyah for smiling and he had a niyyah for crying. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are but by intentions. And so we should smile for Allah, we should cry for Allah. We should smile to alleviate pain and we should cry out of pain for our ummah, all at the same time. One of my favorite jokes of the Prophet Sallallahu because I've seen many of the companion that he joked with Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a joke with a man named Zahir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Zahir was a young man with low self-esteem and he didn't look very good and he knew he didn't look very good and he didn't come from a powerful tribe and he didn't have a lot of money so he used to look down on himself. So when he'd come into the gathering, the Prophet ﷺ would always notice him and the Prophet ﷺ would uplift him and the Prophet ﷺ would say, Zahid is our man in the desert, like Zahid is watching things for us, like he's giving him severe importance But the most beautiful joke is when the Prophet ﷺ finds Zahid in the marketplace. And you know, think about how we walk past the poor. We walk past the custodians. We walk past the people that are doing that type of work. We don't even say salam to them as if they're not even Muslims, as if they're not even there, human beings. For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to notice in that society, with all of the people you can imagine rushing towards him at all times Sallallahu Alaihi for him to notice Zahir And then to say, let me go make a joke with him. And he goes behind Zahir and he picks him up and he starts saying, Man yashtari hadh al-abd, man yashtari hadh al-abd, who's going to purchase the slave, who's going to purchase the slave? And Zahir radiallahu anhu initially thinks that it's just someone, then he realizes, you know, the, the grip of the Prophet sallallahu So he says, once I realized it was the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi I just let myself go. Who would, who would not want the Prophet sallallahu alayhi to be embracing them, right? So when he's doing that, it, he makes a comment and he says, Ya Rasulullah, who would want to buy me anyway? Imagine how low he thinks of himself, like, even if I was a slave, no one would purchase me for anything. And the Prophet ﷺ says to him, and you can imagine, like a loving father, a loving brother, he says, but you're priceless in the sight of Allah. You have no idea your worth in the sight of Allah. Imagine how Zahir came to the marketplace that day and how he went home. He went to the marketplace thinking he has no worth. He left the marketplace being told by the Prophet ﷺ that his worth is too much to be quantified by the creation. 
<laughs> that in the sight of Allah, he's worth so much. And the Prophet ﷺ was the opposite of every bad quality in the Qur'an and he was the manifestation of every good quality in the Qur'an. So when Allah says, لا يسخر قوم من قوم, don't mock people, don't belittle people. The Prophet ﷺ hated mockery. And the Prophet ﷺ was على خلق عظيم, on an exalted standard of character and he wanted to bring everyone to a higher level of akhlaq. So the time when Ibn Mas'ud عنه, his legs showed, right? And they were so skinny. And some of the Sahaba laughed at how skinny his legs were. The Prophet said, why are you laughing? Ya Rasulullah, look how skinny his legs are. He says, those two legs are the size of Uhud on the day of judgment. Can you imagine a man walking around with, with legs the size of Uhud and being placed in the Mizan, the scale of good deeds with Uhud as his legs? So the Prophet hated mockery and most of our jokes entail mockery. And the Prophet never humiliated. He always honored. And our jokes should also be jokes that honor people, not jokes that degrade people. If you were given one minute in a Super Bowl commercial to tell millions of people about Prophet Muhammad what would you tell them? I would tell them that there is a man, the last prophet, the beautiful last brick of a structure of prophethood made up of thousands of beautiful bricks, including Noah and Jesus and Moses and Abraham and David, peace be upon them all. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that final beautiful brick of the structure, the missing brick of the structure. He's a child of Ishmael, peace be upon him, Ismail alayhi salam, and he calls you to everything that those prophets called to, but he also has a scripture that is completely unaltered, the divine word of God himself and his example, which is the most perfect manifestation of that perfect word, is documented perfectly as a roadmap for all of us to get to know the God of Moses, the God of Jesus, the God of Abraham, the God of Muhammad. May Allah send his peace and blessings upon them all and you should get to know him so that you can know your purpose in life. Beautiful commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Will you pay for the Super Bowl commercial? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Um, the Prophet Muhammad was also inviting Jews and Christians to Islam and we know that the coming of his, uh, the coming of Muhammad peace be upon him is written in their holy books as well. Why did the Christian and Jewish scholars of that time not believe in him? It's often not about the religion itself, it's about what makes people approach religion in the first place. And so if someone was seeking the Prophet وسلم, and seeking the purity of the message of Abraham, of Ibrahim السلام, then when they saw the Prophet وسلم, they got excited. And if someone was seeking an authority in religion or seeking some sort of access to power or desires in religion rather than true purpose and sincerity of God, then anything that undermines that is going to immediately be isolated and then thrown out of the religion, even if it's the Prophet of Allah himself. And so you look at the example of two men, Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Hussein ibn Salam, who was the chief rabbi of Medina. When he heard about the Prophet وسلم, he immediately went and inquired. He saw his face. He said, I knew that that's not the face of a liar. And he heard him speak. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Afshu salam wa at'imu ta'am, spread peace and feed the people and pray at night while other people are sleeping and establish your ties of kinship. You'll enter paradise in peace. And he heard the message of the Prophet وسلم, and he said, that's him. And he immediately embraced the Prophet وسلم, the most learned rabbi in Medina. Huyay ibn Akhtab, on the other hand, who was also claiming to be waiting for the Prophet وسلم, as soon as he heard that the Prophet وسلم, had come and he realized that this would mean bad thing for his power, bad news for his power, then Huyay ibn Akhtab said, he is my enemy as long as he lives and I am his enemy as long as I live. I will fight him until the end. So it wasn't about the purity. Allah says, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ They know him as much as they know their own children. Does anyone not recognize their children? They recognized him right away. But the difference between Najashi and Abyssinia, who bore witness that not only was he the prophet of Allah, and Najashi is a learned Christian scholar whose eyes swelled with tears and who sent a message to the Prophet وسلم, and said, if I could come to you and carry your shoes, I would, but I have a responsibility here in Abyssinia. The difference between him and Heraclius in Rome was not the lack of recognition. It was the willingness to sacrifice on one hand and the lack of willingness to sacrifice on the other hand. They both knew he was him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so what I say to people is that, look, if you're really seeking the faith of Abraham, the message of Jesus, the message of Moses, the message of Muhammad, the message of the prophets, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon them all, then it is upon you to seriously inquire into who he was, peace and blessings be upon him, into the claims to prophethood, into the proofs and evidences that he presented, and do so with an open mind and an open heart. And it is very hard to study the dala'il and shama'il, the proofs and character of the Prophet Muhammad and walk away and say, yeah, he's just an ordinary man or a false prophet. 
it would be very, very, very hard, near impossible, for any sincere inquirer to come away with that type of a conclusion. Did, did the Messenger of Allah ever get angry? If he was angry, what was it about? So the description of the Prophet ﷺ is that وَمَنْ تَقَمَ لِنَفْسِهِ قَطْ He never got angry for himself. He only got angry when Allah's law was transgressed upon or Allah's sacred creation was transgressed upon. And so it was transgression that angered the Prophet ﷺ and not even transgression against him والسلام, So he's always very willing to overlook things against him وسلم, But if you exploited in front of him another person, then you'd see the anger of the Prophet ﷺ. And if you transgressed the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he's the messenger of Allah وسلم, then you would see his anger. But because his anger وسلم, was for the right reasons, it never came out in the wrong ways. So if it's anger for Allah, then you're not going to curse and be egotistical and beat your chest. You're going to show your anger with dignity as well, with perspective as well. I give people this example. Aisha radiallahu anha says, I never saw the Prophet وسلم, angrier than this moment. It's when she said about Khadija radiallahu anha because the Prophet وسلم, would mention Khadija so much. And Aisha got jealous even though she never met Khadija, right? She was too young and she never met Khadija. So one day she said, hasn't Allah given you someone better than the old toothless woman of Quraysh? Talking about Khadija. These are our mothers fighting, Aisha radiallahu anha and Khadija radiallahu anha. And she said the Prophet وسلم, was so angry, right? She saw his face turn red. She saw his hair stand وسلم, like, how dare you, right? Now there are two ways that the Prophet وسلم, could have reacted. He could have degraded Aisha or honored Khadija. Which one did he choose? He said, I swear by Allah that Allah did not give me better than her. She believed in me when no one else believed in me. She spent on me when other people withheld from me. She supported me when no one else would support me. And Allah gave me children through her and he did not give me children through other than her. She's the mother of my children. So. The angriest the Prophet ﷺ is, and he's responding to the one who provoked the anger. And the Prophet ﷺ did not curse. The Prophet ﷺ did not hit. The Prophet ﷺ did not degrade. Because his anger was not for him, it was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this case, that meant defending Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, who was not in the room at the time. If you had the opportunity to watch just one of his days uh, when, when he was alive, which day would that be? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are so many days. So many days I wish I could be with him alayhi salatu wasalam. But um, there are kind of two things for me. It's like either when the Prophet sallam, was very sad. So I think of the Prophet sallam, burying Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and the pain that he felt receiving Khadija radiallahu anha in the ground. And the Prophet sallam, was with her and he didn't pray janazah. There was no janazah. It was in Ramadan, there was no fasting. Khadija radiallahu anha never prayed the five daily prayers. She died before the salawat were obligated upon the summa. And so on the one hand, like I'd want to be with the Prophet وسلم, on that day. But more than that, I think to, like I think of Fatah Mecca, the conquest of Mecca. They say, you know, you really see the character of a man when he's on top, when he has power. I would have loved to be riding a horse next to the Prophet وسلم, doing tawaf with him, standing next to him when he stood on Safa, again, this time not rejected, but this time with hundreds of thousands or over a hundred thousand people following him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, seeing that Allah's promise came true, being able to celebrate that with him, alayhi salatu wasalam. I think that's what recently I've just been thinking about, that day of victory. So a day of great pain or a day of great victory, those two things are the things that are there. And I know I'm giving you more of days, but I also think about Ramadan, like imagine the 27th night with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, or last 10 nights with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, like the state of his heart. It's always pure and beautiful, but like, can you imagine if, if people's iman rubs off and like being in the companionship of the righteous rubs off on you? Can you imagine being with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, in the last 10 nights of Ramadan? I can't even imagine what it would be like. I can't imagine being with him وسلم, outside of the last 10 nights of Ramadan. I really can't imagine how beautiful it would be to be in his companionship in the last 10 nights of Ramadan وسلم, and maybe catch a rak'ah of qiyam with him or two rak'ahs of qiyam with him or pray with it with him or uh, listen to him read the Qur'an or read the Qur'an with him وسلم. It's those last 10 nights of Ramadan are from a seasonal perspective. There is a moment every, every Ramadan where like, I'm like, Ya Allah, it would have been beautiful. Right? So may Allah give us that, that moment with Him in Al Firdaus Al A'la. So there is this incident that I, I really am affected the most, maybe uh, in terms of the dignity of a believer. Was there an incident that the Prophet emphasized it in his lifetime? You know, when he was uh, saluting the Kaaba and, you know. Uh, yeah, so it's actually, subhanAllah, very interesting because the Prophet وسلم, in the Hajjat al Wada' and the farewell Hajj, you know. Most of the Sahaba became Sahaba because of Hajjat al Wada'. Because you have to see the Prophet and believe in him to be a companion. Most people met the Prophet 
that would be considered Sahaba on Hajj al Wada' on that one Hajj and achieve that status. And his messages, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are very clear. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu used to warn, do not go back to being kuffar, to being disbelievers, striking at each other's necks again, right? So he's warning Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about division in the Ummah. And that day, as the Prophet Sallallahu is making tawaf on the Eid of Hajj al Wada', the Prophet Sallallahu addresses the Kaaba. And he says, how beautiful are you? How pure are you? How sacred are you? But with all of that, by the one in whose hand is my soul, the sanctity of the believer, his wealth, his blood, his honor is more than yours. Can you imagine being a new Muslim? You're coming out of tribalism and you're seeing the Prophet ﷺ elevate the sanctity of the believer to that level. So don't you dare go back to striking each other's necks and killing one another and fighting one another because the message of Tawheed, the oneness of God, unifies. And it allows us to melt our differences through that transcendent cause of Tawheed. That Tawheed overtakes it all. All of you grab onto the rope of Allah. The rope of the, Allah is the Quran. Transcends all of our differences. So, O oh, Ummah of Muhammad Wasallam, do not go back to fighting each other the way that you used to before this religion came. If the only thing the religion has become to you is another tool for division and ego and agenda and cult and tribe, then you're failing to internalize it properly. This deen is not a tool for you. This deen is a way by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites an ummah and makes us one. And so that's the message of the Prophet sallallahu the dignity of the believer. Can you imagine if we saw someone attacking the Kaaba, what it would provoke in the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu You're seeing the Kaaba being destroyed every day in Gaza. Every single day on your screen, you're seeing it be destroyed in Gaza. That should provoke something in each and every single one of us. That's the honor of a believer, the blood of a believer, the property of a believer, just being taken away right in front of us all the time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our incapacity and allow us to do more for our brothers and sisters. How did the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him die and what was his last words? The Prophet Sallallahu died of a sickness when he was 63 years old and his last words were spoken in the lap of his wife Aisha ta'ala anha when the fever had become severe and the angel Gabriel had entered upon him and the Prophet Sallallahu said Bal Rafiq al-A'la, Bal Rafiq al-A'la Rather I choose the highest companion because he was given the choice between living amongst his people here or going to the highest companion. And he chose the highest companion and he recited verses and words to that extent. And so his last words were words of glory and words of longing to be with the Lord who sent him here in the first place. Last question, if Allah grants you Jannah, inshallah, and you see the Prophet for the first time, what would you want to say to him? people, I got to ask the question, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Muhammad. I would, I would just thank him for everything he bore for us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everything he endured for us, alayhi salatu wa sallam. Like, you know, like when, when you think about, if, if you start to think about, you know, every rock that hit him, every insult, he did that for me, right? Someone took a, a beating for you. Um, why did he have to lose Khadija radiallahu anha, Abu Talib, and lose his reputation in Mecca for those days and suffer all of that? What kept the Prophet Sallallahu going except his sincerity to his Lord and his sincerity to the people that he was calling back to his Lord. So I would just thank him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for all that he bore for us. And, and, you know, if you start thinking about things differently, like, look, that every stone that hit him in Ta'if hit him for me. If the Prophet Sallallahu still had faith in, in, in humanity and his Ummah to, to grow out of that, then it becomes very, very, very different. So, Jazakallahu Khaira, Ya Rasulullah, Jazakallahu Khaira. May Allah reward you, and I hope it was worth it when you hear all the salawat coming towards you and you see the, the size of your ummah coming to you lovingly on the Day of Judgment. Jazakallah khair for your sincere answers, Shaykh Omar Suleiman. As for his humility, inshallah, we really thank you and we hope to meet our beloved Prophet. Allahumma salli wa sallam barakallahu wa rahmatullahi 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 wa rahm